Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Welcome to the MSL Solutions Investor Conference Call. We've got all attendees now in listen-only mode. Um, on the call today, we've got MSL CEO Pat Howard and CFO David Marshall. I'll pass you across in a moment to Pat to kick off our discussion of the company's four-year results. Um, today, we'll have a presentation from Pat and David, followed by an opportunity for Q&A. If you would like to ask a question during the call, please type it into the Q&A panel within the Zoom app. Uh, alternatively, if you've dialed in using your phone, feel free to email any questions across to me at tim at nwrcommunications.com.au and we can address them that way. So to kick things off, I'll hand over now to MSL CEO, Pat Howard. Go ahead, Pat. As always, thank you very much, very much Tim. And on behalf of the MSL directors and staff, um, I'm very pleased um, to announce results. I think the take home messages today um, is a record revenue, record EBITDA, uh, we've got a record backlog and we've got a really strong cash position that continues to grow and we're a profitable, cash flow positive technology company. So they're the headlines. Um, we've beaten guidance um, from what we put forward in May and so we're very positive about what we're presenting today and our outlook into the future. I'm just going to take you along the bottom of the panel here. Um, we're now at 8,500 venues, and that's a mix of venues. They are big stadiums. They can be small local pubs and clubs. They can be golf courses, but 8,500. Of those, um, they transact or have digital assets processing 14 billion in POS transactions. That's across 28 countries with that POS. And then there's 500 integrations, and those integrations are starting to generate digital revenue, and you'll see that digital revenue uh, uh, a line item that we'll present later on in this. In terms of our golf software, there are 14 million rounds of golf globally were run off MSL software. And the Golf Australia app that MSL helped uh, create has been the biggest golf uh, app downloaded in the last year with 150,000 uh, downloads. Working from left to right uh, in our POS golf and digital strategy, um, providing uh, we have fully integrated POS system. It's a big system. It's a source of all truth for many of our locations in many types of enterprise systems and enterprise venues. Uh, there are 7,500 POS and 1,000 golf. That's your 8,500. As we said, 14 billion in annual transaction value. And it's a modular system that can work on many different devices that can scale up and scale down with uh, the customer's needs and wants. And we have kitchen video systems, we have waiter systems, we have the ability to work on many different devices. Uh, it's a very, very robust system. To help with your own modelling and for investors understanding, SwiftPOS, which is one of the two POS uh, systems we own, usually or typically it's a three to five year contract as a start and then and seems to roll over. Where Automate is a monthly SaaS uh, product that uh, is, is very easily deployable and easily be rolled out mm -hmm. and has a significant amount of integrations as well. In our golf, uh, uh, we have the, our contract with Golf Australia, goes out to March 2025. We have Global Golf Federations, name a few, Sweden, Norway, Finland. And then we have over a 1,000 golf clubs that are under those systems in many of those nations. Um, 1.9 million golfers, we run handicaps for all of those, for the golfers on the call. If you have a Golf Link card, we are Golf Link. Uh, Six million rounds of golf for book through Golf Box Classic, which is our European uh, golf management system. And 10 million rounds of, of golf processed in world handicapping just in Australia alone. Uh, it's a fee for you a fee uh, basis, so subscription per fee. And there's also underneath that sales and recurring revenue model as well. In our digital, and just to highlight um, our digital solutions, uh, it works in order of ways, our own IP. Uh, one of the acquisitions that we, uh, one of the benefits of the order mate uh, acquisition was that we've got significant revenues through third party integrators, particularly Hungry Hungry is a very big driver of that. Um, we know that they drive bigger basket sizes. We have deployed um, uh, our own IP into 123 locations and our digital revenue is now up to 1.4 million over the year. Now, this is a line item we didn't have two years ago and we can um, believe it will be growing, strongly believe it will be growing in the next little bit, uh, the next couple of years. It's a transaction fee per order, so it's not a cost to the customer, uh, uh, to the uh, venue, a cost to the customer. To go into the financials, I'll just uh, deal with that's in my way. Um, the highlights, 33.9 million record revenue. 
that's 37% up on the year before. 5.3 million on EBITDA, that's 70% up on the year before as well, excluding the government uh, support from F in the FY21 year. Our EBITDA margin is 15.6%, and you'll see that has grown in the second half versus the, uh, the first half of the year, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. Our organic revenue growth is 16%, even though our overall growth is 37%. We really want to try and be able to show that not only have we acquired well, we've also had organic growth as well. 82% uh, increase in new sales on PCP compared to the year before, 13, over $13 million, and our cash continues to grow. Uh, as of the 30th of June, it was 9.4 million, and we have that nil interest-bearing debt. We do have a convertible note, but that is at 0% interest. Uh, just to go into the journey of the last couple of years, um, obviously uh, we had last couple of years affected by COVID, but most certainly the last 12 months, driven directors and MSL generally had a really strong view about revenue growth and we're very proud of the results that we've been able to put forward. Uh, the record revenue growth of 33.9 mil, the revenue growth in itself of 9.4, which is the 37%. The, of that, Organic is 4 million, 16%. Obviously, the other 21% is automate. Swift Pots on its own as a product that we acquired back in November 2020 has grown by 30%. And automate revenue growth on a like for like basis is 20%. So, both our organic growth and our acquisition growth has been very strong. This slide demonstrates, and uh, Tony Tui, myself, and David Marshall, uh, the management team joined uh, in the first half of FY20 with a real focus on that turnaround and a focus on cash, EBITDA, and obviously recently over the last 12 months turned to revenue. That EBITDA number has been um, considerably stable uh, and growing. We've had 18% EBITDA margin in the second half in the second half of this year. In the first half, there was a large sale of one of our reseller products in the UK, which in fact which influenced that one-off number, but we've got some really sustainable EBITDA margin now. In UK, Denmark, and Australia, all of them have individually increased their revenue and EBITDA. As I said, the current management joined in the first half of FY20. We have an 82% increase in new sales, primarily driven by SwiftPOS and Automate products. And we'll pull that data out for you. Working from left to right and, and trying to be able to read this, obviously our full year results are on the left. We then pull out the Automate results, which is nine months of results to show you the organic results and we're very happy about that 28 million versus 24 the year before the variance of those numbers the growth overall so what we're trying to very much explain through the process the actual growth of 37 percent 82 percent and 70 percent on the right hand side but that organic growth 16 to 16 percent revenue growth 49 percent new sales 10 percent increase in like for like costs and uh, a 34 percent contribution to the EBITDA uh, we do have um, some legacy products that we'll pull out a little bit, and that does affect some of the organic growth numbers. Um, so we want to be able to, uh, that's how we can explain that difference between that swift boss growth and the overall revenue growth. From a segment view, um, we've been able to keep corporate overhead steady, so uh, not the bloated uh, central body. Uh, so 4.2 million in both FY21 and FY22. We have seen then revenue grow in each one of the jurisdictions. And we've seen EBITDA grow in each one of the jurisdictions as well. Uh, particularly UK is transitioning from a reseller model to a uh, of third parties to SwiftPOS. And we're very proud of both the sales we've got and the pipeline that is coming. Now, we don't talk about pipeline often. Just to understand our, our terminology, backlog is contracts we've won and pipeline are uh, potential. We don't talk about or quantify that at this point. Backlog is absolutely contracts that have already won. So we're excited about what is coming in the UK as well. In terms of cash flow, uh, we are a cash flow positive business. Um, receipts from customers are the best part of 10 million greater than the prior year. We have no interest bearing debt and the cash balance plus access to capital and debt positions MSL for acquisitions in line with strategy. We'll make acquisitions um, very, we have a model that we, we uh, um, view and considerably strongly. And we're very proud of both the autumn and the Swift Boss acquisitions in each of the last two financial years. Just pulling out the core product growth 
Uh, so it's obviously 17% growth from 17 to 20 mil. Uh, the automated acquisition uh, of 2.1 million, and that excludes any digital revenue that comes in a later component. The SWIFT post growth, 977. Golf growth, which we expect to um, continue to, to be strong in, into FY23. And the digital growth, which has components of Hungry Hungry, Order Away, uh, all those integrations that have to work with the POS um, are a key component of driving that revenue, and, and we are a central point of truth. Uh, it's important to um, pull out that we have been offset by a decline in legacy and third-party recurring revenue. Uh, really, um, we've only got really one more year of that process, and we'll be able to really drive our core products into the future. Going to sales. Uh, strong sales in FY22, and if I point to the stadiums Queensland, which is the biggest um, sale that MSL has done, we still haven't recognised that revenue. That will be into FY23. So we have a geographically diverse organic and acquisition growth across multiple segments. The POS growth and APAC enterprise and stadium deals, we went to six tenders in FY22 and we won all six tenders uh, for stadiums. And um, we've got a very strong role in the... Um, arena space in Australia as well. Big, strong contribution from Automate. Golf, MSL is a new product launch of golf management. There's the golf scoring app, record growth in golf membership in Australia, and it continues to grow that golf link revenue. In digital revenue and data, payments and integrations, new deals have been struck with Tyro, Doshi, Deliberact, Hungry Hungry, and me and you. And we all get a, a, a revenue share of the money that goes through our point of sale. And that's why those integrations, our ability to have an open integration model allows POS revenue, golf revenue, and digital revenue. There has been strong enterprise deals with Swift Post and stadium deals with Capture very early, uh, nearly the best part of the 12 months ago. Um, and it's been a positive revenue drive for the UK business rebound well above pre COVID levels. I've mentioned Backlog a few times. Um, we've got a 43% increase in the backlog that we talked about uh, as of December th uh, 31 of 2.4 million, both in the UK and Australia. Uh, that includes that very big deal of stadiums, Queensland. Uh, and I just want to be very, very clear once again, these are contracts that have been won. And once implementation has been uh, delivered, we will then recognise that revenue. So we would expect all of that 2.4 million to be recognised in the next six months as we come out for the half year at FY23. A little bit of focus on the left of the acquisition of Automate and what has happened since we've acquired. Uh, Automate walking down the left-hand side of the slide. Uh, we've increased the monthly SAS revenue by 150%. So the monthly uh, SAS revenue in October when we acquired was uh, 21,000 uh, a month. It's now slightly above 50. Uh, we have digital recurring revenue coming in at over half a million dollars. We've implemented 142 new businesses and helped 371 customers grow their business with new pods. So both uh, the ability to grow with businesses and the ability um, to be able to drive uh, new business through Automate has been a real positive through uh, that team. We've also um, inherited some very good people through that process. So the acquisition of SwiftPost and Automate have brought technology and great, really strong people into the mix. And cutting down and just trying to break up that Eight and a half thousand uh, venues for you, uh, seven and a half thousand are POS, a thousand golf club and federations, and we have third party product venues as well. When we talk about um, some of the, the billions that are going through our POS, I look at Liberty, United, and Freedom Fuels through our reseller channels. You look at some of the member based organisations uh, like the leagues clubs that are open 24 seven there's a lot of revenue going through those point of sale and we are the central point of truth as the point of sale in a lot of those locations or many and it's important the enterprise point of sale becomes a central point of truth to how we operate we've looked to scale i take the group train down the bottom right hand side with automate look to scale with those businesses and as many of you know we're in those iconic stadiums and arenas in golf uh, we've had a new golf launch we've um improved or increased the number of personnel both in Europe and in Australia. Um, we've constantly in dialogue. I met up with um, the federations for the first opportunity we'd had to travel overseas um, over the past couple of months and the golf box tournament um, 
uh, software is incredibly well valued to deliver in uh, all of those federations and running their handicap as all golfers know is incredibly incredibly important we have long-term contracts with national federations that provide strong retention and very low customer churn our golf brands as we've talked about golf link for every every golfer out there is a very well-known product and with golf box it's in, continued to improve profitability despite disruptions in europe um, we have done a simple golf rebrand. Uh, we used to have several different golf management systems. We brought them all under one um, system, and that obviously allows far more focus and development and growth into the future. In digital, uh, we had had 1.4 million in digital revenue growth. Uh, both there is a, a recurring component and an ongoing upfront component, which pulled out the financial results. We have a digital arm uh, of our business that puts mobile application in the hands of the consumer. So a lot of this is B2C revenue, business to consumer revenue, rather than the majority of our revenue, which is business to business. We continue to expand our digital capabilities with digital guest engagement, technology, new revenue streams for venues and value for customers, and continually releasing updates and upgrade positions. And it's important to understand that we have multiple service delivery options, the in-seat, click and collect, the traditional way of going up and ordering, we believe that our tailored offering and full flexibility is a really point of difference. We do integrate with third-party revenue streams. We have our own IP as well. We have a positive outlook for the digital revenue growth with integration of Doshi, Swift Boss, and Automate. Hungry Hungry integrates into Automate and further integrations revenue share from other third-party applications and payment uh, deliverers. MSL continues to open integrations, allow third-party providers where it makes sense to connect and utilise the core process to provide revenue streams to MSL. For Outlook, we're going to continue to increase our large venue pipeline and core locations. We said this last year and we've done that. Uh, we want to continue to grow uh, both in UK and particularly we've started the process in the US leveraging payments, suppliers and data relationships to maximise further revenue and margin. We will continue to be agnostic where we can to allow integrations that make sense. We have new golf products that have allowed for growth into FY23. Um, focusing on the and beyond uh, component on the right-hand side, we want to make sure that we continue to be um, utilise that MSL POS and the le leverage the 14 billion of transactions and how important that is to operations of these large venues. When we increase our venue size, as I've said, backlog and pipeline, we're very excited by both of those and continue to extend and now grow the new golf contracts. Uh, we have got a large global addressable market and we have a very, very good product that has been shown to work in, in the enterprise space. And we are the dominant player in that APAC space now that we want to be able to take overseas in the enterprise market. The global smart market is reopening and has been very positive and we're getting a lot of good feedback around that. We have that long-term golf contract model. Uh, whilst we have small golf clubs that are involved, the long-term golf contracts with those federations uh, is incredibly important. We will collaborate. We will deal with partnerships. We look, look for large enterprises. Uh, our improving profitability on EBITDA margin and EBITDA is something we're incredibly proud of. We have done what we said we would do, and we're going to increase our growth. Um, as I started this, we've talked about record revenue, record EBITDA, uh, record backlog, and cash flow that is in, um, a cash flow positive business that continues to grow. Um, we're incredibly proud of those results, um, and I'd like to thank Tony Tui, uh, the chairman, for his leadership and the board. Um, and David Marshall, the CFO, and all the leadership team behind that. It's um, been a very positive year for MSL um, in this regard. And, and look, uh, look forward to any questions. And uh, Tim, I might hand back to you at this stage. Very good, Pat. Thanks for the presentation. Obviously, um, good to see that the growth is continuing to come and the, um, the strategy is being, um, being delivered. So thank you both. Um, thanks to attendees for all the questions that have come in ahead of time and on the call so let's hop straight in um uh one that's come in um just looking specifically to the golf side of the business the question is can you be more specific on where the growth in golf is coming from is it new federations or countries or is it expansion within the current countries there's a little bit of both so particularly um 
and I was at the British Open, for, and thank you for the question, I was at the British Open, and the, the Golf Box Tournament Package is a very well-valued product. So our ability to grow within the federations that are looking to invest in technology, and we're working them on specific pro projects to enhance that technology, they are part of the roadmap and helping develop that. In saying that, World Handicap is being, is being driven out of RNA. It was very much uh, implemented and driven by the RNA and USPGA uh, um, well before David and I joined here, but it was all about travelling golf and being able to take your handicap all over the world. There's been a year or two where that really has been put on the back burner. Um, that drive is coming. Now, uh, it's an important segue into putting golf management systems in, tournament management systems in, and running people's handicap. Uh, we are one of only five companies in the world on the World Handicapping Panel. We're the only Australian company on that panel. Um, and I think we all know how important golf handicapping is to golfers so we we these things are not um, they don't happen quickly the large federation roles are important about building trust and we have done that over that period delivering what we said we were going to do but we also have the ability to roll out uh, b2b and i also believe in the future b2c and um, it's part of where our product and roadmap is going Thanks, Pat. And Flair, just to expand on that, can you um, remind us of the synergies that you see between the golf business and the other parts of the MSL business? Yeah, look, there's, there's a great opportunity. I think, you know, we golfers um, often spend a reasonable amount of money. I saw that at uh, the British Open recently as people flying in the helicopters, um, but it's uh, mainly Americans at this point. Um, but the ability to use order away with Golf Australia handicaps and actually facilitate payments, facilitate that through um our member portal and the, our ability to do that with our GMS systems allow Golf Australia an easier way to handicap um, audit those processes. So we, we're investigating lots of ways to aid the golfer and the golf club to be able to measure their payments and get that work done. So we, um, we see a lot of opportunity to facilitate the payment and possibly take a, a, a role in that payment as well. Very good. Thanks, Pat. Um, we've had a few questions on the, the legacy side of the business. Can, can you point out um, how much of FY22's recurring revenue is still from legacy and third-party products that you expect to increase going forward? Dave, I might pass yeah. to you for the exact numbers, yeah. Yeah, no, thanks, Pat, and thanks, Tim, for the question. Look, I think um, if you refer to the slide 12 where we, we spoke about the net legacy and third-party being a decline about 1.2 million, um, what we expect to see in FY23 is, is a similar number for essentially what was a historical pause uh, business we're reselling. That'll come out of our recurring revenue, our support and maintenance um, revenue line. Really important to note there as well that um, it, it may not, we will record it as a loss for that product, but it, we actually may transition, and this is a real objective of us um, in regard to those customer sites, is to transition them into the Swift Pause, uh, particularly the Swift Pause product. So, the, the product loss may actually turn into a growth in the other uh, side of business and Swift Pulse growth, and we've seen that in FY22. But in short, to answer your question, it'll be similar to what we've disclosed this year uh, at the net legacy and third party loss. And um, and then we we actually, um, we've gone a long way to, to minimising that loss going forward. So once it's come out in 23, it's probably been um, not going to be material to our numbers. Thanks, David. That's probably a good lead into another question, which has been, um, can you comment on the decline of legacy and third party revenue continuing? But based on what you've just said there, it sounds like um, you've got some mitigation strategies in place there. Yeah, absolutely. And I think to give a practical example for investors, um, Canterbury Leagues was a third party product implemented by MSL a very long time ago. Uh, we continue to talk to them. It was a low margin but high revenue product and we've replaced it with Swift Boss. And um, if you go into our website, there is um, some advocacy from the customer about that transition and the positivity around that transition. So I think um, our ability to trans transition those customers off when they want to has been a really positive part of that process. So we're seeing significant growth in our core products and the low margin uh, legacy products. We wanted to call out and make it very clear that they were there, but at the same stage, we're incredibly uh, proud of the Swift Post growth at 30% and the automate growth at um, 20% in that in that um, in a like for like basis. Thanks, Pat. Um, just a question trying to get uh, around the um 
sort of the headcount and where people are deployed. Um, the question is, um, so how many people are employed in business development and in sales and also how many POS resellers in golf and Swift POS? Uh, that's a, uh, uh, and I'll help out there, Dave, uh, first, if you want me to, um, unless you want to go, Ben. I, oh, look, I, I, th I think important to note, we've, um, we've obviously uh, picked up some costs through the automated acquisition. You can see in the face of our p &L, our sales and marketing uh, expenses have grown by 14% year on year. A lot of that's the, uh, the inclusion of, of automated for the nine months. Similarly, our customer support tech services has grown similarly. Um, our R&D is showing a, a greater growth, uh, but that's mainly because the automate R&D costs we've taken on, we have not capitalised in this fiscal year. Um, and in general, in admin expenses, we've got some, particularly some benefits in FY21, um, which weren't repeated in FY22, and I'm including government incentives in there, um, and, a, and a large um, a large write back of essentially doubtful debts in FY21 as well that were recorded against there. So, so what you're actually seeing is a business that uh, and it has kept its 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 cost base, its overheads um, pretty consistent, although scaling with with the acquisitions. So what we're really looking at doing, we're we're increasing our revenue, we're increasing our margin by the exiting of third party products and the acceleration of our own. And, and ensuring our overheads growing at a, a lower rate. And that's why we're getting the EBITDA growth. Um, and, um, and we continue to look at how we can, can best, and, it, and it's a moving um, experience for us as, as our needs in the business grow, but we're, we're, we're pretty switched on in being able to, to identify where we need our resources in each of our sectors, whether it's in sales, whether it's in tech support, whether it's in R&D. And um, and we're we're still nimble enough to be able to ensure we ensure we're efficient in each of those areas. Very good, thanks, David. Um, we've had a few questions on seasonality and um, the sales cycle, so I'll, I'll I'll sort of put them together. So one that's come in is asking for the bigger POS sites like clubs and stadiums. What is the average sales cycle, and does that get complicated by consultants and or integrators? Well, we're the integrator. Um, so that, that uh, we'll do the professional services and, and that's pulled out in, I think, note four of the financial statements, David, from, from memory. So, um, but uh, the sales cycle can be long. And, you know, often if you go to some of the large stadiums, most stadiums in Australia are government entities. So you have to go through a probity check and, and there's a long process there to make sure that you tender. So um, at the same stage, we have our resellers that can deploy relatively quickly uh, or some of our direct sales automate um, to deploy very, very quickly. And if we go all the way to order away, we can deploy uh, that or even our golf management systems uh, remotely. So we have a, a couple of different ways that we can cycle through deployment, which means we can recognise the revenue at different, different scales and different times. But the large enterprise deals do take time uh, and... Uh, but we have converted a significant amount of those to monthly direct debit uh, and SaaS, as you saw in the automate um, uh, period. So there was a period uh, that when David and I joined that there were annual annuals, they are becoming far less and we're getting far more monthly um, monthly direct debits. Anything you want to, did I answer that question? Anything to add, Dave? No, I think you've covered it pretty well there, Pat. Very good, thanks, gents. Um, the next question comments that given the events of the last four or five half years, it makes it a bit tricky to get a sense for the H1, H2 seasonality in the various businesses. So are we able to provide a feel for the seasonal revenue or seasonal EBITDA under steady state conditions? Uh, look, I think the first time that we have had a non-COVID affected period is this last six months. Um, and we haven't sold any uh, other third party revenues. So um, we're very excited by what is possible. Um, so I think to be too predictive, I think would be uh, something I'd be uncomfortable with, but uh, I'm trying to point to you, um, the backlog is a fairly good indicator of a, a very, very strong start to FY23. So we're very, very positive about what is possible. Um, we've been here uh, three years, uh, funnily enough, tomorrow. <laughs> so, um, and... Uh, a lot of that time has been a really interesting time to be in hospitality. We're, we're seeing the world uh, come back to normal. Um, 
whilst there are cost pressures in our venues that we deal with, we see that we can help our customers out in that regard. We can help those venues drive uh, better margins uh, with our point of sale because we have an enterprise solution that can really help deliver um, benefits to those uh, on the ground. So we're seeing a lot of opportunity, we're seeing a lot of tender opportunity, we're seeing a lot of referral, we're seeing a lot of growth as I showed with the Automate um, automate uh, growth just through new business of existing customers. So uh, I'm incredibly positive about where we can go with revenue EBITDA and that consistent margin. The EBITDA margin on automate is in that investor presentation. I think David's around about 21%. And so we see um, the sales of our own IP is going to really help continue to grow that EBITDA margin and, and give you a bottom line outcome. Very good. Um, so now, notwithstanding the fact that I don't think you've given specific guidance on revenue or earnings looking forward, a question's come in asking, would second half EBITDA of 3.1 million make annualised 6.2 be a reasonable base for FY23 earnings? <laughs> and you're going to keep asking, aren't you? Of course you are. Yep. Um, I, I'm going to let every analyst go through and make and make their assessments and their assumptions. But I think that graph has shown that we have we've delivered on what we said we would do. We would continue to do so. Um, even in May, uh, we put out some guidance, and this is a collective guidance where we are conservative. We make sure we deliver on what we're going to deliver on. So if we do say something, we deliver on it. But look, I, I'm going to let um, the analysts go through and make their assumptions. But we've been very clear that um, the backlog is strong. Um, our EBITDA margin will continue to be strong. And um, I do believe that we have an excellent product and really a leader in the enterprise POS, POS space. And I believe we're going to have um, a very positive year overall in, in golf. Um, so I'm um, and off the back of that we will get digital revenue growth. So I'm really positive about FY23, really, really positive. Very good. Thanks, Pat. Um, now, just you, you did begin to the EBITDA margins on that previous question, but just to come at it from a different angle, uh, a question's come in asking, is the EBITDA margin growth in FY23 likely to be more from gross margin percentage or do you see any OPEX savings possible from here or do you expect further OPEX investment on R&D and sales? Dave, do you want to go first? Yeah, look, I, I think, and I'll just refer to my earlier answer, I think what we're, we're looking to do is absolutely grow, grow revenue. We're growing revenue from our own intellectual property, which is going to give us a, a margin, uh, gross margin benefit. Um, we, as we grow, we will have, you know, this inflationary impacts and just growth uh, impacts on our cost base. Uh, but our OPEX will grow at a lower rate than our gross margin dollars is our goal. So we continue to open those jewels, if you will, on the EBITDA and the EBITDA margin. So that's, um, so it, it's, I, I don't think we're sitting on a whole bunch of uh, potential cost savings in our OPEX. Um, our goal has been and will continue to be efficient in the deployment of those, particularly our human resources. They're 70 odd percent of our, our OPEX. Um, and how we deploy them and um, across each of our functional areas to, to achieve our goals of having a good product we can drive in the market at greater growth rates and higher margins and more de efficiently deploy to meet our customers' needs, the, uh, the better our, um, our performance will be. I think to add to David's comment, and, and often we get asked about sales and sales channels, we have we have direct sales channels and we have um, and also through Automate as well. But I didn't answer the question earlier around that reseller network. There are 40 reseller companies in Australia alone and they hire best part of 120, 130 stuff and they sell Swipos. Uh, and some of them are starting to sell automate. And so we um, we do really respect that reseller network in areas that we can't locate. So it helps us grow, uh, helps the product grow and gives other reseller networks and channels, allowing us to focus on um, the larger enterprise deals. Um, so we, we really value both sales channels. Very good. Thanks, gents. Um, we've had a few questions on international expansion, so I'll just group them together here. Um, question is, how's the initial biz dev going in the US now that we can travel again? Is the in-country partnership and the relationship from Tobin helpful so far? Um, and uh, have you got employees on the ground in the USA, uh, USA and should we expect contract wins this year? 
So I'll answer, there's a couple of questions in there. Thanks, Tim, just to confuse me. Um, <laughs> and look, in, in June and July, I was in the US and in UK. I was with Torben the whole time. Um, so, uh, and the chairman and myself and often uh, David Marshall, CFO, we do meet with Torben uh, Monday regularly. And that's at a couple of levels. There's, there's the acquisition conversation. And then there's also the ability to talk about operations and organic. I've met with several stadiums, uh, several arenas, several opportunities. Um, and as we talked about earlier, these, these are large deals that take time. We haven't been, we haven't been driving automate. We've been driving Swift Pod in that part of the world. Um, in saying that we're 12 months ahead in the UK and uh, those sales are going well. And I'm very, very optimistic about um, what we're going to be able to deliver in the UK in FY23. Um, I do believe we're going to get um, deals across the line in the US. I am positive around that. Um, but any expectation that it's going to, to be very quick and very fast in July, August, September, I'm not all Always, that's not how these these larger enterprise deals work. But once you get those deals in, we have been very sticky. Our churn of our own IP has been very, very low. And as a consequence, we are winning by referral and winning by the quality of our products time and time again. And um, I'm, I, I do believe that we'll get wins in, in those locations and, and several announceable ones. I know that uh, many of our deals we don't announce to the market because they're smaller and a couple hundred thousand and they don't move the market. Even the Stadium of Queensland deal, our biggest ever deal, didn't move the market considerably. Um, but these are big, meaningful deals, and we really value those customers um, trusting the point of sale and our implementation teams to deliver a great result. Very good. Thanks, Pat. There were several pieces to that US-UK question, so I'll probably throw a few, a few bits to you in one, in one, big, one big chunk. But the, the only other piece to it really was, um, is there any sort of material revenue coming from the USA just yet? And... Can you let us know how many people we've got on the ground over in the States trying to get the job okay, done? No, let's answer that question first. So people on the ground, no. Yep. So I'll run that from out from here and from the UK. I have seen so many businesses burn so much money by being able to um, go and hire three or four salespeople that can't open the door. I will keep going back. Um, I can open that door and that's what I will do and continue to drive that. But we're not going to go and put four or five staff on the ground and try and um, sell a product they possibly don't understand and don't believe in. Uh, there are um, several um, of MSL staff have been to the US in the couple, last couple of months. Uh, there are several Australian-based UK star, uh, staff in the UK right now, um, and we will continue to do it that way. Uh, if we then get great sales that we can try and um, support, absolutely we'll do it that way. So it will be opportunity-led. It's not that far a flight. I'm happy to get on the ground there, but we'll make sure at the time when we support that we've got a, a really good functioning base. So we will can always consider this, but it, it's a very sh uh, quick way to um, lose a lot of uh, lose a lot of costs and not a lot of revenue gain in the short term. Yeah, makes sense. Thanks, Matt. Um, just back to golf briefly. Um, do you expect the golf link contract to be extended, or will 2025 be the end of it? And can you talk to the level of competition in this arena? Uh, we are one of the five in the world. We're the only Australian ones that do it. Um, that's there's your competition. Um, so and uh, so, Golf Australia would have to go with a non-Australian entity. That's where you start. But there are no guarantees in life. Um, and but uh, we have been talking with Golf Australia constantly, and um, they are our partner. We work very closely with them. Um, we've reduced call rates, reduced, um, increased our answer rates and really proud of what we're delivering on the ground with them and some of the uh, our product enhancement that we've delivered for them. So um, we'll continue to um, have dialogue with them and have an open tender, which, which has been in play. So that, that's step one. Uh, there was a second question, was it? Uh, the second piece of that. Um, no, no, oh, well, um, no, it really was just um, uh, are there serious competitors or you know, what, what does the contract look like beyond 2025? So I think you've covered it, so. Thank you. Oh, good. Um, just uh, looking to your business model as a whole, is there a desire to push more of your customers or even more of your products to a SaaS model over the longer term? 
It was, and, and Dave, I, I might defer to you in a second, but look, I, I think what we're trying to pull out in that automate slide is the growth in SaaS and how important uh, having those two different POS solutions are. You know, Swift POS is a three to five long term model. It's an excellent model. And these are, when you have a look at the Swift POS wins, they, a lot of them are government backed entities. So it's, it's a really fantastic client and customer to have. In saying that, that monthly SaaS revenue through Automate, um, we really value and we've shown that growth in that model. And that's been led very, very well by Lee Richardson um, in, in that process. And so um, we um, are really excited about what we can do under two different models. And we like both of them and we think we're gonna be customer led. And I think that's the important thing, Pat. You know, we, we can offer, and obviously we continue to progress and keep our technology current and contemporary. That's one thing, the underlying um, technology, but the second is how we, how we contract with the customer. Um, and many of them do want to be in that SaaS environment, the SaaS technology and be paying, you know, their subscription for on a monthly basis and, and, um, and show their, their cost of that product uh, as an operating expense line. Others want the CapEx. They want to be able to buy the petrol license up front, book it as a capital item. They, they may even want to, um, and they do this, deploy it in their own server, in their own environment, so they can manage it, and for security and for all those other things as well. Um, we have, in the time Pat and I have been here, I don't think we've expressed uh, a strong desire to push the, the clients either way. It's uh, very much customer led. And uh, we're fortunate to have the, the ability in our products and our delivery mechanisms to, uh, to give the customers those choices. Yep, flexibility is valuable. Thanks, gents. Um, so uh, looking to the Outlook slide from the presentation, um, what, one of the attendees has picked up on the comment there that you're planning to leverage payment supplier and data relationships to maximize revenue and margin. So are we able to provide some practical potential monetization examples of those kind of activities? Well, I can go to things we've done because, uh, and, and we've already negotiating with, you know, I, I talked to the Tyro deal that is um, in, in a previous slide. So there are um, payment providers and digital providers that have to, have to link in or integrate in with our POS system and we collect parts of their revenue. So we, we really value the integration of the POS. That's something we've been very strong on over the past 12 to 18 months. And if you want to use um, our point of sale system and you want to integrate in with our point of sale system, then we expect to collect a revenue fee along the way as well. So there are payment providers that do that um, and there are several of them already and we'll make sure we continue to drive that. Now, we also want to make sure, as we talked about earlier, as David mentioned, that we want to be able to give um, the venues some choice. Now, some venues, they want to go with their bank. They want to go with a separate payment provider. Um, we can leverage that in many different ways. And our ability to be agnostic with payment providers and third-party integrators gives our venues choice, still allowing us as MSL to be the central point of truth in any one of those venues. Perfect. Thanks, Pat. Um, just down to our last couple of questions now that relate to capital management. So any attendees with other questions, please pop them into the Q&A box and we'll, we'll, we'll pick them up that way. Um, so the question is, are you, uh, have you made any further progress on further M&A deals? And if so, would these likely to be adding product or geography or vertical integration? Uh, <laughs> um, one of the great things in these roles, you are always um, open to M&A activity and they are in a constant place and time. And, um, and I'm sure any CEO or any, anybody that's been on these calls, you're constantly in that M&A conversation and I've been in enough data rooms to, to deal with that. But we also want to make um, proper conversations and proper acquisitions that make sense. Geographies do make sense. Um, 
you know, I, I've seen some of our competitors at times buy other POS providers in countries to make that work. And so um, we've seen it done that way. We've seen us all leverage uh, our POS elsewhere. We've seen that in golf and, and golf amalgamation as well. So um, both across POS, golf and our digital arm uh, in different geographies, we will be open to that and we have been open to that on deals that make sense. Um, our chairman is on the call and I'm not going to ask him to speak. He wanted to take a nice back seat in this one. But, you know, we, um, we spend a lot of time in DD rooms doing a lot of due diligence and things that make sense. But we are in such a strong financial position um, compared to a lot of our competitors that we want to be able to, uh, when we spend our cash for the right thing or, or um, work with our shareholders to raise capital, we want to make sure it makes sense. And um, so that's how we look at this. And I think just to add, add to that, with the support of our board, uh, we've been extraordinarily disciplined in what we have acquired. I think if you look at Swift Bosnian and the Automate acquisitions we've made in the last couple of years, uh, they've been strategically sound, they've... Um, contributed to revenue growth, they've contributed to profits growth, they've contributed to cash, operating cash flow growth. So it's, um, and they've been, and we've been able to grow their revenue uh, from acquisitions. So they've been a greater world. So our, our discipline there is, uh, I think, strong in our selection process and we go through to acquire and integrate. And um, and that's a discipline we, we will continue. Thanks, Jens. Um, the only other further piece to the M and A question, it might be you, you might be limited in what you can say about specific targets, but um, the questions come in: Would it make any sense to bind up with Capture the way that you successfully acquired SwiftPost? Uh, well, as you said, you can't say too much of these things. But no, look, I, I've been asked that question before, and obviously, Capture is a product based out of the UK. We do know it well. Um, we have had a um, uh, in history. We did with SwiftPost was a reseller. But we are trying to focus on our own IP at the moment. So we do know the Capture product well, um, and uh, but I think it's a very nice suggestion from the question from the uh, from the um, person that asked them. I've been asked. Them. I'm only kidding. So we'll um. <laughs> so, look, so look, we are always open to lots of opportunity, um, and I can't say too much about any specific deal, but we'll always consider anything. Yep, sounds good. Um, Questions come in ahead of time. Um, would management consider using excess cash flows to buy back shares around the current price point of 15, 16 cents, which is a 20, 30% discount to the last raise price, or is reinvestment in the business going to deliver a better return at the current levels? Um, Dave, I'll probably take this and please um, dovetail in at the right time. Look, I think um, it's a really sensible, and I actually respect the question, you know, um, you know, how you use your capital at different times is going to be a very important, it's a very logical step. We'll consider everything at any given time, but the reality is that we, um, the rest of our industry and market, a lot of them have tried to um, drive sales for sales growth. They're often cash flow negative. Uh, and there are opportunities out there. And I think, um, you know, to go and invest your buy, uh, in a share buyback or dividends, or it means that I've, I've got nothing better to offer the shareholders at the time. So um, we want to be able to continue to grow um, our cash whilst it looks really, really strong compared to where MSL has been historically. Um, you know, there are a lot, lot of software providers out there that raised a lot more money than that have a lot more cash um, than we do and so we are and we're often in competitive tenders with those those businesses so um i I'd probably keep our powder dry but i actually respect the question and i think it, it's it's a fair question yeah and i think just dovetail with our pack you know in the, in the current markets you've got you know valuations of it companies a little bit suppressed um you've got the ability to raise uh debt a little bit more challenged um, we, uh, we've spoken about in a missed call, you know, we are, look, you know, we will look at acquisition opportunities that look right. So it, it feels at the moment holding, holding on the cash for that opportunity, uh, to make, uh, smart acquisitions in this market, um, seems the appropriate capital management strategy at the moment. Makes but sense. As, as you rightly said, it's always open for review as circumstances change. Yep. Sounds good. Thanks, gents. Um, now the last question that we've had, oh, actually, no, we've had two questions. Um, so one that's just popped in, just to query why you don't report NPAT A, N-P-A-T-A. NPAT, I know, What's what would NPAT A be? <laughs> uh, 
net profit after tax and before amortisation. I think it is, but um, the maths can be done there. The bulk of our, well, the amortisation's uh, disclosed in there. But we, we've tried really hard in the last three years to be really quite clean in what we report um, and to not to, to confuse with too many acronyms. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of that uh, acronym that's used by some, some companies. The mass is easy there for people to back, uh, backfill that, uh, back engineer that if I need to. So yeah. disclosures are there. Cool. Um, now, uh, in just 10 short years, the Olympics will be in MSL's home city of Brisbane. Um, so on a sort of, Looking into your crystal ball, what, in, what impact do you anticipate the 2032 Olympics to bring in for a company like MSL? Oh, we're, we're really excited about the vision and we talk about it being destination software where you'll be going between a MSL restaurant into an MSL stadium and, um, you know, having an opportunity to own the travel the whole way between all of those locations. So we see we're working with those providers and, you know, Stadiums Queensland's a big one, um, but a lot of our providers around where we can go and have a great opportunity. There are many stadiums under Stadiums Queensland's watch. Um, and really, there's only one stadium in, the, in Queensland that's not under that model, but um, we're very excited about that. Sarah Kelly, uh, one of our directors, is on the Brisbane Olympic Committee, um, and so that that uh, wasn't um, – we got in first, but we knew that Sarah was – um, such a powerhouse in the sports and marketing and futuristic roles of sport and Sarah's playing an outstanding role in leading both our roadmap and, and driving our sales and, and futuristically looking to, suit, to future proof us. That's great. Thanks, Pat. Um, now, that's all the questions we've had come in for the moment. So on behalf of MSL, I'd really like to thank everyone for tuning in. Uh, we really appreciate everyone joining us today and for your continued interest and support of MSL. Uh, we're really looking forward to the opportunity to talk to you again. And Pat, I might pass across to you for any closing comments. No, I'd like to reiterate what I said at the start. I'd like to thank our staff. I'd like to thank the shareholders and I'd like to thank the directors. It's been a really positive year for MSL. Um, and David and I couldn't do the work we've done um, without the support of all of you. So thank you very much. I, I appreciate your time. And I know many of you have got some one-on-ones at some stage. We're really happy to communicate with you, both David and my details are at the bottom of the ASX announcement and really happy to continue any conversations. Excellent. Thanks, Pat. Thanks, David. Thanks, attendees. We'll chat to you again soon. Cheers. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Absolutely.